Mr. Lear, first of all, condolences uh, on the death of your son. I know this is something that is very difficult to have to navigate, but I also very much appreciate your taking the time to talk to us so we can bring some more journalistic attention to what has happened here. Thank you so much, uh, Glenn. It's my pleasure being with you. And uh, my intention uh, for this interview is that I wish the world would become aware of what happened to my son. My son was right, so, assassinated. So, let's, so, let's get into it. Let's get into it step by yeah. step, just so that people can kind of follow along. You, because there's some way. people who don't know. So I want to just kind of yeah. lay the foundation for everything. Um, I you have seen. I have seen as I've been talking about this case, and other people have been talking about this case. Some of the most rabid supporters of Ukraine who peddle disinformation all the time, actually calling to doubt whether or not your son even died in a Ukrainian prison, whether he's still in a Ukrainian prison, whether he's still alive. How did you find out about the death of your son? And what is it that you learned about the circumstances of his death when you were told that this has happened? Well, the process was uh, very simple. The finally, my son arrived into a hospital on January the 4th, because he had double pneumonia, he had uh, pneumothorax, and he had a heavy case, an acute case of edema. He could not breathe. He would lose conscience if he spoke for more than two minutes. And this is a small note that he wrote to his sister, my daughter. Now, once he arrived in that hospital, the following week he died how do we know the director of this ukrainian hospital in the city of kharkiv called the u.s embassy and informed them that my son gonzalo had died the official from the u.s embassy called my daughter and told her about my son's death. And this was on January the 12th. And that's how I heard of my son's death in a hospital sent by the jailers that he had been for eight months incommunicado in the city of Kharkiv. My son did not have an attorney other than a court appointed attorney that did not speak any English. And my son's charges were that he was a pro, so I mean, Russian propagandist, because as a blogger reporter, he had over 300 subscri uh, subscribers in the various websites that he had, and he told them the reasons for Russia invading Ukraine. He explained the why. And he ventured in his analysis that Ukraine would never win a war against Russia, no matter what help they received from the USA or the NATO countries. Right, and just to he be clear, your, your son was your son was uh, a citizen both of Chile and the United States. So he was an American citizen at the time that he was well, expressing if, these if, views. If, is that is that? If I may, yeah, uh, go ahead. give you some details. Yeah, Gonzalo was born in Burbank, in the city of Los Angeles, in 1968, while I was doing my postgraduate work in economics. He was born in the USA, and he was brought up in the USA up until he was 11 years old. At that time, we moved to Santiago, Chile, where he finished his high school in Santiago to go back to the USA to Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. 
after graduating from uh, Dartmouth, he stayed in the USA. He published a book called Counterparts, published by Putnam uh, Editorial in New York, and stayed in the USA for many years. He's, uh, he's an, he was an American citizen. There is no doubt about it. Now, while he came to Chile as a son of a Chilean, uh, as an aside, uh, Glenn, at the beginning he was a wetback because his his papers, his tourist papers, you know, expired. His and his daughter, uh, his sister. So we had to make all arrangements, you know, and obviously they gave them the Chilean nationality, and that's why he had dual nationality. Right. So but he was born in, in the, the United USA. States. Yeah. So when and obviously anyone born in the United States receives automatic lifelong citizenship, uh, an American passport and all of that and the full rights of all American citizens under the Constitution. Now, he was 55 years old when he died, which obviously is very young, especially to die of pneumonia. Usually a 55 year old man in generally good health will be able to combat pneumonia if it's treated properly with just the basic minimum treatment. Did your son have any serious or chronic health problems before his problems in Ukraine with the law began? My son had a mild case uh, of, of heart disease, the coronary arteries. He never had a heart stroke, by the way. When he was detained on May the 1st, Gonzalo was in totally normal health. He was physically apt. He had never been sick in a hospital. And Gonzalo, again, let me repeat, he was in excellent health. Now, he was a heavy smoker, though. But he had no case of any severe illness. Now, when you now, were told by, or I'm sorry, when your daughter was told, when Gonzalo's brother, your daughter, was told by uh, the U.S. Embassy, uh, that the hospital had told them that your son had died. After that, at any point, did anyone provide anything in writing to you? Did you ever learn any more information from the United States uh, consulate about the circumstances of his death? No, none whatsoever. As a matter of fact, if I may explain, since day one, when my son was detained, according to the embassy protocol around the world, an official of the embassy has to go and speak to the detained American citizen in a country overseas immediately, offering him legal assistance immediately, offering them communication with the family. None of those things the U.S. Embassy did. Because my son was detained, Glenn, due to Biden's giving the green light. I am not the first one to say it in these words. Someone else said it before. Senile Biden gave the green light to dictator Zelensky to detain my son. And let me tell you why. My son was detained the first time by the SPO, which is the local Gestapo, in the year 22. On April the 5th through April the 22nd, that full week, he was detained. Then released without any legal charge, no charges on, on him. But, of course, those savages stole all his equi electronic equipment, stole money from him, and he came back to an apartment that had been ransacked. He recovered all of his equipment and continued with the same language, criticizing bloody, sinister dictator Zelensky and the way the war was being carried out, venturing on March 22nd, a week, a month after the invasion. 
that Ukraine would never win a war against Russia, that the all of the economic sanctions would backfire in the USA, and it would hurt the economies of Europe, and it would hurt the economy of the USA. If you see the economic numbers for Russia, they have been growing during the war. Now, he continued the same language, as I said before, criticizing the dictator Zelensky in Ukraine. But hear me out on this one. After a full year, after being detained and released those seven days, Gonzalo, for the first time, put a video criticizing senile Biden, as he referred to President Biden, and stupid Kamala Harris, as he referred to the vice president, because he said, I have never seen a woman so stupid as Kamala Harris. He went on to criticize Biden on the 27th of April, the year 2023. Four days later, Gonzalo is detained by machine gun soldiers in mass, at least 12 of them went to his apartment to break down practically the door of his apartment and they detained him four days after he criticized for the first time senile Biden. Right. I think it's now, worth emphasizing there, by the way, that as an American citizen, obviously he has the absolute right to criticize the president and the vice president in as harsh of terms as he wants. And there's plenty of other people saying what he said about Absolutely. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. But it, I remember, you know, as somebody who's been covering this war, watching his reports from Ukraine, his YouTube reports and others, and was amazed at the courage that it took after he was detained at the start of the war, seeing how dissidents were being treated in Ukraine to continue to speak out so boldly, so forcefully. Now, let me just, I want to, I'm sure you, I know you've seen this before, but for those people who haven't, he posted a video on July 31st, 2023. And it's amazing because the criticisms that you have been explaining that he voiced, which I remember at the time, all basically turned out to be true, that Ukraine had no chance to win, that it would end up harming the European and American economy while bolstering the Russian economy. But here in July, uh, the last day of July, 2023, he basically posted a video knowing that if he wasn't saved by the U.S. government, if people didn't intervene to get him free and to get him out of that country, he knew exactly what would happen, which was that he would end up being killed in prison. So let's just watch this video for those who haven't seen it, and then I want to hear your reaction to it. My case originally started as a free speech issue. But because of the SBU and the inherent corruption of the SBU and the criminal justice system in Ukraine, I will definitely be sent to a prison labor camp where I will most certainly die. And so I decided that the smart thing was take my chances in terms of getting across the border. Um, I, you know, I should have warned you about that. I know how hard that is to when you're going through grief to see a video of the person you lost. Um, believe me, I understand. Um, but I think it's very important for people to have heard because I just want to make sure that nobody thinks that the American government and the Biden administration wasn't aware of his case. A lot of us were talking about it at the time. This video circulated everywhere. And so what I want to know from you is, was there any moment, obviously he's asking for help there, when his family, when, when you or anybody else asked the United States government to intervene in any way in order to help him? And are you aware of any efforts that the consulate made to ensure that his rights were being protected? I sent many letters to embassy officials, including Ambassador Brinken, I explained to them the fact that my son was a U.S. citizen and they had not done a thing to help him out. 
They didn't even provide an attorney. The uh, defense attorney that Gonzalo had was appointed by the court, Glenn. Can you believe that? The court of Ukraine appointed the defense attorney, and hear me, who didn't speak any English. How the hell could he communicate with my son? They used a translator. I had communication with this man, Viktor Serkovny, through WhatsApp with the translator, you know, in the middle, which doesn't translate exactly, you know, how, you know, the intention or the meaning of the words. I couldn't speak to the man. Now, the U.S. Embassy's behavior was unbelievable. I mean, they wanted Gonzalo to die. And I was always asking myself before falling asleep, was my son that important? He had 300 and some subscribers. He had hundreds of thousands of viewers. But had he become that important that merit to detain him? I mean, it's outrageous. What have I done so far since my poor son died? I have uh, placed in the Secretary of State uh, Department the Freedom of Information Act. I want to know all correspondence documents between Mr. Blinken, Victoria Nuland, and the lady ambassador Brink of the USA in Ukraine that transpired between January the 1st of the year 22 concerning my son Gonzalo. I want to know all communication exchanges between that area and the government of Ukraine or any official of the uh, Ukrainian government because what they did to my son is an assassination. My son did not have any criminal charges. My son used the power of freedom of speech. I even marched in the year 1965, you see Berkeley, Mario Savio, free speech movement, the anti-war, the anti-Vietnam war. I marched in those years, Glenn. I was studying at that time in the USA. I lived many years in the USA, and I cannot condone this terrible government that the USA has, that has no place in the White House. We had never had a worse government than this one. This man, Biden, is responsible for my son's assassination because the judgment, the trial never came. They arrested him. He had been in jail for eight months without a trial. And why? I read in different places in Ukraine that many of the political opposition to Zelensky, they would be detained by the SBU, exactly as my son was detained. And they would keep them in jail for months because what were they doing? Their intention was to make them ill and have them die of natural causes. That is what they did to my son Gonzalo Lira, those criminal dictator that, that the USA is maintaining. How much money is Zelensky getting from the 115 billion that we have accounted so far? How much has plowed into his pocket? And how much is Hunter Biden getting? You know, I think, I think I think one of the important things to note here is that obviously the United States government has influence with most countries, probably more than any country. It has the most influence in Ukraine given the fact that the Ukrainians are completely dependent on the largesse of the American government to pay for their war, to prop them up. We're going to pay for the reconstruction of Ukraine once this war is done and once we've helped destroy it. And had the Biden administration even lifted a finger in defense of your son, he would have 
obviously been released from prison without having been convicted of a crime, and certainly they would not have been allowed to cause him to die in the way that he did. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.